one of the papers we just accepted at OPR is by Locke and Latham, and it's a paper on inductive theory building. And they make a very interesting point in there about control variables. And they say, if you have to use a lot of control variables to find your effect, maybe your effect isn't that important. When we think about theories, control variables are really not part of theory as much. And do they have a role? And I guess you could also think about moderators as well. Like at what point do they become noise? So I just wanted to get your opinion and mm -hmm. your thoughts on control variables with respect to theory. I think that's a very important topic. I have not read that paper. I have uh, great respect and admiration for, for uh, Ed Locke and, and Gary Latham. Uh, Jeremy Bernerth and I wrote a paper in 2016 in the journal Personnel Psychology on best practices on the use of control variables. Mm. And we have a, a, a chart, a figure, uh, with a sequence of questions that we suggest researchers should ask before including or not control variables in their models. The first one is, are you including a control variable because a reviewer asked you to include a control <laughs> variable? If the answer is no, move on to the next right. step. You don't want to do that. Are you including a control variable because everyone else in that field, in that domain, has used that control variable in the past? Also another not good reason to include control variables. And we, we go through a, a sequence of questions. Now, the, the very label control variable is a little deceiving. Right. Because you think now you have control over your design or over your results. Essentially what you're doing is putting variables in the model that are related to other variables. And when you do that, you take variance out of the system. You take variance out of the dependent variable. If the control variable is correlated with other predictors, you're taking variance out of the predictors as well. So the question from a theory perspective is what's left? What is that residual variance after you included the control? What is, it, what is it left? Maybe it's very small, maybe it's not meaningful, maybe it is not what you're we're planning to measure in the first place. So the control variable, like everything else, it needs to be a rationale and a logic, which currently does not exist in the field. We did a big review of journals and we found that the most typical control variables are demographic variables, right. age, gender, in strategy, size of firms. Of course. But for example, the size of a firm is a very critical predictor. In fact, it is the strongest predictor of firm performance <laughs> of all of the predictors we have ever studied. The bigger the firm, the more money it makes. Right. So if you take that out, you take out a lot of information. Because if you have a very large firm, there are many things that happen in a large firm. You have more bureaucracy, more procedures, more controls. It's probably an older firm. And many other factors that you're removing from your theory by including that control variable. So this is not just a, a, what seems to be a superficial uh, methodological or statistical decision. Including or not control variables in a model uh, has important implications for what is it exactly that you are studying because at the end of the day, you don't know what is that residual variance that was left in the DV. Um, the second point you raised is contingencies, moderators, which typically get confused with mediators. The, the confusion between moderators and mediators Mediators are intervening variables. So A causes B, B causes C, B is a mediator. It explains why A is related to C. The moderator is a variable that tells you conditions under which the effect may be larger or smaller. So A affects B depending on C. When C is high, the relationship between A and B is small. And when uh, B is low, the relationship between A and the, and the outcome is, is higher. So, the, the need to include contingencies in your model, in your theory, moderators, is a way to patch up a theory <laughs> that is not working. <laughs> because you say, well, the theory actually does work, but under these conditions right. it works better, under these other conditions it doesn't work that well. So people call this a boundary condition. But at what point you have 50 boundary conditions right. for the theory that the theory is no longer useful? Because when you think about a relationship between two variables and you say, well, I cannot really tell you if A causes B or not because first I need to know what's happening with C, D, E, F, and so on, so on. Right. Therefore, I don't know much about the relationship between A and B. So one of the critical uh, uh, criteria for knowing if you have a good theory is parsimony. If you have a model 
that includes 10 moderators, I would say that is not very parsimonious, and therefore it is not a very good theory. One quick thing I just wanted to mention, you m talked about using partialing of variance to understand a theory and really what the contribution is. I think that's a great idea because it really does make a strong connection between the theory and how it will be tested. And thinking about there's only so much variance to go around, what are the things that really matter is a really great way to try and reduce to all the things that might, from all the things that might matter. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and the issue of how much variance we explain is also a criterion for evaluating a theory because how much of reality are you explaining, how much of behaviors or firm performance are you explaining with your variables? If you only explain 5% of variance, 7% of variance, that's not a lot. Uh, it really is not a lot in terms of practitioners making decisions that they know if they do A, B will happen. Cool.